Sounds good. Make sure you're here. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have you all. I know that you all are incredibly busy and appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to attend the supplemental training today. Um, so today we'll be hearing from speakers at a couple of different state agencies about some of the foundational state climate policies that shape or frame a lot of the following subsequent policies and programs that the state has enacted around climate action. Um, do you want to say that this is just the first of these trainings. We'll be able to engage in these topics more down the line. Um, and we're hoping that this session can just help to lay some of the foundation for you as we dig into some of those programs and policies in more depth later on. So our speakers for today are from the California Air Resources Board and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. We have Christina and Anna, if you guys can wave really quickly just to so folks see who you are, great. And then from the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, we have Juliet Finley Hart from the Climate Team. Juliet, I think I saw you, if you wanna wave, folks see who you are. And then we also have Aegon Turplin from the Planning Team and Regions Rise Together Initiative who will be joining at about the halfway mark. So today, um, this is our agenda. Obviously, I am opening up with the welcome and objectives. Um, then we have, will have Christina and Anna covering some of the work that they do around um, cap and trade and the fourth investment plan. And then Julia will be covering some of the work that she does around climate adaptation, resilience, and mitigation um, at OPR. And Aegon then will go on to talk about the SB 375 process. Um, some of the partners involved in that regional planning aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions through land use decisions. Um, and then, who is that? Okay, then we'll Sorry. have, no, all good. Um, then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion at the end. Um, all that being said, if our agenda, like I know that this is, we probably could spend two hours on each of these topics easily um, going over them. So I know there'll be a lot of questions, um, a lot more discussion that we'll wanna have. So I think that we can take questions after each one. If we end up stretching each presenter's time a little bit, I think that's fine. We can just nix the discussion time at the end. Um, and in order to make sure we can get to everybody's questions, um, if you can enter them into the chat while uh, they are being, while the presentations are going on or email us afterwards, we can coordinate with the presenters to make sure that we get all those questions and then we can um, get those answers back to you and not have anybody kind of left off. So um, the policies covered today might provide, we're hoping, some framing for what local and regional governments are responding to in terms of the state's mandates, incentives, suggestions around approaching climate. Um, we think this could be important because you, through your work, are responding to community needs. Local and regional governments are responding to what the state is requiring. So this might be the start of an opportunity for you to be able to translate community needs through some of those state requirements to kind of make that case to local and regional governments. Um, additionally, in some of your initial meetings on CNAs that we've had so far, some of you have expressed interest in using your CNA to help spur development of a climate action plan or an update to the general plan or a specific element of it. And this, along with future sessions, might help you get a sense of a few of those policies that you can use. Um, I think, then with that, here's some topics to consider. I'm so sorry, my cat is like really, really trying to get on screen um, to think about as we go through the presentation. So much like the rest of the work we've been doing, opportunities for new partnerships that kind of come up during the presentations that could help you advance your community's goals, opportunities for you, your org, or partners on the ground to engage in some of these statewide and regional policy processes, 
um, thinking about your experience engaging on these topics in the past on any level, and then identifying connections between these policies and action being taken locally, whether you see alignment or not, and just kind of reflecting on that. So I think with that, I will stop there and we can pass it over to Christina and Anna. Um, one last thing, actually, if you all want to um, just drop your name in the chat um, along with your organization, anything to introduce yourself, that might be nice so the presenters can get a little bit of sense of who you are and where you're coming from. Coral, we already beat you to it. Well, that is great. <laughs> Is this showing up in presentation mode for folks? I think you got to hit uh, present. I did. It's selected. Still no? No. Okay. Let me do just a second. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, hi everyone. As Coral mentioned, uh, my name is Cristina Chiverria, and we I will be presenting along with my colleague Anna Scudell, um, who should be one of these face boxes here. I'm not sure if she's waving. I can't see her face box at the moment, but I'm really excited to get to join today and speak to you all, um, and mostly really excited to meet you. I know that you've all been selected because you're doing really amazing community level work. And above everything, I'm just really excited to see all of the great ways that this cohort experience is gonna help build capacity in your communities and all the great things you'll go on to do. Um, so I'll be joining you again in June and we'll discuss California climate investments a little bit further with a bit of a deeper dive, uh, but we wanted to give you an overview of how the funding programs available through California climate investments are informed by state policy and how these policies then translate into investment into California's communities. So in short, California Climate Investments is a statewide initiative and it puts billions of cap and trade dollars to work which means that we are investing directly into communities. So the investments are made up of over 40 programs that are administered by over 20 state agencies, the logos of which are shown here. And through these programs, we fund a really wide scope of projects that aim to reduce greenhouse gases, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and support a wide range of environmental, economic, public health, and equity goals, among others. Um, we'll go into the types of programs that are uh, that have funding later on when we talk in June. Um, but as of May 2020, we have invested $6.4 billion towards project implementation. Now, funding for California climate investments comes from the cap and trade program. In short, entities that are covered by cap and trade must either reduce their emissions or purchase allowances via auctions that happen on a quarterly basis. Now, auctions generate proceeds, and then part of those proceeds are, de are deposited into the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is often abbreviated as GGRF. And today, that fund has generated over $13 billion. So the way that then these dollars are used um, depends on the outcomes of the process that is shown here. The key thing to know is that the appropriation of GGRF dollars or Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund dollars go through the annual state budget process every single year. And the legislature is really who makes appropriations to agencies who then go on and implement programs. Um, a few things to know about how these funds are allocated. 65% of the funds are continuously appropriated to a subset of programs that focus on housing, transportation, and water. Um, and then additionally, there are some uh, set aside set for programs that fund forest health, as well as some discretionary funding. Um, so that discretionary funding amount is then what's budgeted through the annual budget process. And then the use of these funds is really intended to maximize a variety of benefits and advance equity while supporting transparency, accountability, um, all with the use of these public dollars. Okay, 
So in the spirit of that accountability I just mentioned, here's some of the data on how outcomes have emerged from this process. Um, this is how the money has been used. You'll see here that the projects range from land preservation and restoration to transit service addition and expansion um, to zero emission plug-in vehicle rebates. Now, over 4,560,000 ,000 individual projects have been implemented, and these individual projects cover a wide range of project types, and these projects are proposed directly by local governments, community organizations, tribal governments, and a whole collection of other entities. Um, in short, California Climate Investments funds zero emission vehicles, equipment and transit, active transportation, affordable housing, urban greening, renewable energy, um, energy efficiency, recycling and composting, forest health, fire prevention, coastal planning, research, workforce development, and a ton more. Um, and then a specific point that we really um, prioritize is really this piece right here. Um, so I really wanna point out the funding that goes to benefit priority populations. Now, Priority populations is defined as disadvantaged communities as well as low income communities. Um, and we have statutory minimums that require that 35% of the funds go directly to those communities. Today, well, as of May 2020, um, and new data will be coming out shortly, um, but as of May 2020, the percentage that's actually been invested into these priority populations, which again are what we consider disadvantaged or low-income communities based off of CalEnviro screen, um, that percentage is actually 55%. So we've been over, um, or not over, but we've been able to invest higher than what the statutory minimum is, but um, this also comes with the asterisk that, yes, we are higher than the statutory minimum, but we're consistently and constantly seeking ways to make programs more accessible, to fund engagement and outreach to let communities know that the funding opportunities are available to them, and to seek to really reach every area of the state that is categorized as either disadvantaged or low income. So. 55% is higher than what we're obligated to do, but we're always making progress and we are always looking forward to input and hearing any suggestion folks have, which includes all of you. Um, so we welcome any and all suggestions that you all have. Now, the, Cal the, Car Sorry. the California Air Resources Board, which is where I work, serves as the hub for these um, California climate investments. So while they're administered by a lot of different agencies, CARBS plays a very special role. And the role that it plays is really bringing these four realms on the screen together. Um, namely, we draft funding guidelines and methodologies for tracking, and we track and report investments, outcomes, and benefits. We also coordinate among programs and we conduct outreach to eligible applicants and draft, and draft investment recommendations. Now, I work largely on the coordination and engagement sphere over here which I'll share more about in June, but to tell us a little bit about the investment recommendation piece, here's Anna Scudell. Great, uh, thank you, Christina, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just got such a, a great overview of a lot of the different work that happens in the sort of California climate investments umbrella. Um, so I'll just take a few more minutes to talk about one specific effort that's ongoing right now. And the goal of which is to really guide the investment of auction proceeds of that pot of funding that we're talking about. And that's the development of what we call the investment plan. So the investment plan is a fairly high level document that identifies investment opportunities for the legislature to consider in that budget process. Um, and so the Department of Finance, uh, for those who aren't familiar, that's basically kind of the governor's budget office, um, works with CARB to put together this investment plan every three years. And so we're now in the process of working on the fourth plan, um, which is due to the legislature in January of 2022. And the investment plan is sort of one opportunity to influence what gets funded out of this pot of funding. Um, and it establishes some of those kind of high level priorities for the administration. Um, but I will flag as, as Christina mentioned just a few slides ago that the legislature and the governor determine the appropriations to specific programs 
through that annual budget process. And it's really important um, you know, for, for communities to be organized and advocating through that process um, you know, with legislature and the governor to kind of make sure priorities are represented then. And um, that annual process is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of what gets funded. Um, but the investment plan that we're working on now is really designed to guide those decisions and we want it to be a helpful tool and so we're really interested in kind of feedback for, for how we can make it as, as useful for you all as possible. Um, so in terms of developing the investment plan, um, and Christine, if you could move to the next slide, thank you. We've established a set of kind of four overarching guiding principles to help us prioritize the recommendations that, that we'll include in the plan. Um, and so I think these are all sort of fairly straightforward and consistent with a lot of the conversations that we have at the state level around climate policy. Um, you know, first, just recognizing that there's a lot of really critical state climate goals and we want the investments from this pot of funding to support implementation of those goals, things like carbon neutrality, um, nature-based solutions, zero emission vehicles, reducing vehicle miles traveled, shared mobility, those kinds of solutions. Um, but second, you know, advancing equity is a really core component of this program. We want the investment plan to identify kind of how this pot of funding can most effectively advance equity, both in terms of kind of providing benefits to folks in need and also looking at resources for planning and capacity building to make sure that everyone um, sort of has uh, the support that they need to participate in and really lead these efforts. Um, third, you know, and certainly tied to the equity component is recognizing the need to use these investments to improve public health. There's a lot of opportunities there from various project types that can, you know, support improved air quality, um, reduce uh, impacts from extreme heat, um, support active transportation. So there's some opportunities there that we want to prioritize. And lastly, you know, I think uh, certainly Having this meeting on Zoom reminds us that we're still very much in the COVID-19 pandemic, but that as we're starting to sort of look towards recovery and rebuilding, um, we see this as an opportunity to figure out kind of how can the investment plan and California climate investments as a whole best support a climate resilient economic recovery that kind of leaves us better off than, than before all of this. Um, so that's kind of the, this, these overarching principles and criteria that we're proposing for the investment plan to help guide that prioritization. Um, recognizing that not everything can do all of those things, but the more that we can kind of be coordinated on these different principles, the more likely we are to sort of achieve our collective goals. So then just quickly on the timeline, um, we had a public workshop in February and we're in the process now of working with stakeholders on developing a draft plan. Uh, the draft plan will come out later this summer for public comment and then we have another set of workshops following that. Um, there'll be an informational update for, to our board in late fall. And then as I mentioned, January, 2022 is when the Department of Finance will submit the final plan to the legislature. I mean, I'll just mention in sort of the, the phase we're in now in coordinating with stakeholders, we're really interested in kind of whatever participation any of you all would like to have and, and very open to, to having discussions. So in terms of kind of specific engagement opportunities on the investment plan, um, like I said, we're, uh, we're meeting with a lot of people and having a lot of different really great and informative conversations. And if this is something you're interested in engaging on, please reach out. We're very, very interested in talking with folks, uh, but, you know, recognize that there's a lot of, a lot of different priorities uh, for people. Uh, but so again, please feel free to contact me if you want to um, talk more about this. I'll also mention just a few kind of specific upcoming engagement opportunities. Later this summer, Christina is doing some great work to pull together uh, a webinar focused on uh, funding opportunities for tribal governments. And we'll have specific time carved out during that workshop to get input on the investment plan. Um, again, we'll be releasing a draft for public comment later this summer. Uh, so that's a great opportunity as well to, to inform you know, what ends up in the final version. And uh, we'll be having another public workshop or set of workshops after the draft comes out to get more detailed input. Um, and I'll just really quickly mention that kind of separately from the investment plan, this is just sort of a flag in the the overall notion of trying to inform what kinds of programs get funding um, is that 
you know, as we mentioned, the annual budget process was where the rubber really meets the road. Um, and one upcoming opportunity on that is that the governor will soon be releasing the um, May revise, which is kind of the updated budget that the governor and the legislature will be discussing. So I just wanted to mention that as sort of a near term opportunity for engaging on this. Um, and then I know, uh, I know we have a packed agenda, we're probably already over, so we probably don't have time for um, a lot of uh, discussion right now. Um, but I want to just say, we're super interested in any feedback um, and questions that you have. Um, and just putting up here a few questions that we all have for you as sort of food for thought, either for today or um, to take back to your communities, um, but certainly interested in kind of whatever feedback or questions you have. And I'll just reiterate that um, very much open door. If you want to contact me or Christina or the SGC team, I know can certainly put us all in touch if you want to talk more about this um, or sort of have any conversations around how communities can kind of influence on the, the funding decision side. So thank you for uh, listening in for the time and I will stop talking. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Christina and Anna. Um, super information rich. This recording will be available for you all to rewatch it if you want to kind of go over the information again. Really encourage you to take them up on that offer to connect. This, um, the investment plan directs how billions of dollars are spent on climate in communities like yours. So definitely, definitely a good contact to be making and setting up conversation with. I do think we need to move on to the next item in the agenda just to make sure we're able to move through everything we have to cover today. But um, Christina and Anna, if you want to chat with folks in the chat, I see a couple of questions that come up, you can do it that way, or um, we can collect and, you know, send those via email if you want to take time to do longer responses. And then of course, again, encourage you to find some time to meet potentially. Um, okay, so I think with that, um, we can now move on to Juliet's presentation, which I'm also very excited about. Hi. Good morning still, so it's still good morning. Um, uh, let me bring out my, I've learned I can't talk and like click. I will still try to do it, but I shouldn't. Okay, is my presentation showing? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so hi, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, we've just been so excited about this program, so I just feel really um, lucky to be able to be here and, and share a little bit about what we do and um, and also have want to acknowledge that open door thing that we just really want to talk about all this and see how we can support or be there. So, and I also want to say that I'm joining you from my home office on Coast Miwok land where I feel privileged to be able to take pictures like the one behind me um, due to the stewardship of millennia and time immemorial. So thank you. Um, okay, I am going to talk about the Integrated Climate Adaptation Resiliency Program. Um, so, uh, let me advance. The Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program, or ICARP for short, um, was, the, was set in statute in 2015. And the, the idea behind it was that around that time, a lot of state agencies were all kind of moving forward really quickly on trying to get policies in place for climate adaptation. We were recognizing that there was a lot of work on the mitigation side, which still continues to be a really important piece of this, right? Reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. But there was also a lot of work that needed to be done to be prepared for the future climate impacts. So um, for locals on the ground, this was all very confusing because it was like you had this agency saying this thing and this agency saying that thing. and it was unclear how they, if they, and how they interacted or, you know, and who you were supposed to do what for. So ICARP was created to serve as this kind of hub of, at the state level, among the state agencies to sort of develop this kind of cohesive and coordinated response to um, climate change impacts and planning. So it's not that ICARP oversees any other agencies, we just really are there to connect and convene and bring everyone together. So at least everyone is, is aware of what other agencies are doing. From the inception, equity has been the key piece of it, it that, that was prioritized in the statute. And then also the importance of linking the greenhouse gas emissions projects to adaptation on the ground, because really the best adaptation strategy is 
you know, not having the emissions at the scale that they currently are going, right? And whatever we have to plan for is really driven by whatever we're emitting today. So in the statute, the, there were two main things that kind of were um, mandated. One is the development of an adaptation clearinghouse, which is meant to be this one-stop shop web resource that allows, that just brings all the information together in one place so people can go there to at least start the conversation and then the development of a technical advisory council to make sure that what we're doing is rooted in supporting local implementation. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those programs, um, but I wanna say one of the first things that the council did was, just, was really think about what are the vision and the principles. So number one, equity. Um, number two is a focus on wherever possible using natural systems to plan and protect from climate impacts avoiding maladaptation, you know, if you put one thing in one place, you want to make sure it's not doing harm for some other impact or for, you know, something upstream or downstream or whatever. Um, so trying to have a systems approach really to thinking about how we should be planning for the impacts of climate change. And then collaboration is key, right? We can't do this. We're not, we're not indiv really individuals doing this on our own. This, the only way we're going to get through all of this is if we're working together, trying to bring in the best available science in combination with the local and traditional knowledge because both, they, they paint the full picture and they give the full story. Um, this, this need to balance short, mid and long-term solutions, right? We can't only think about what's gonna happen in the future without thinking about what's happening today and vice versa. And then trying to look at this through multi-benefit. We have to, figure out, that's a lot, <laughs> and then we have to kind of figure out how to bin it all so that we can bite it off in little pieces. And so recognizing that these are very porous kind of bins, we do think about things at the people and community kind of scale, at the natural system scale, and at the infrastructure scale. So um, this is a super busy slide just to kind of give a sense of the different areas that we're working on and ICARP. One is what I just talked about, like really trying to have a coordinated approach to how we're dealing with um, adaptation. So I'll talk in some detail more about this in a second. There's also a finance piece, like we need to pay for all this. We need to make sure that what we're investing in is also doing no harm and at a minimum not adding to the problem. We, um, we need good science. Um, we need to be able to figure out how to incorporate local traditional knowledge with that science to have this really robust suite of information to guide our decision making. And this all has to be done equitably. So there's a ton in there and there's not enough time to go into all of it, but I, and I know we're gonna have more presentations with all of you and conversations with all of you as we go. So I'll just touch on a few right now and then um, so I'm getting distracted by the chat over there, but I'm gonna stay focused. So just so you know about our technical advisory council. So actually I'm gonna flip to the people. Um, there are six state agencies. You only see five right now because um, our um, one of the, the people that was on here from Cal EPA got snatched by the Biden administration. So we're still replacing the EPA person, but we have six state agencies nine local and regional governments, and then representation from CBOs, research and private sector. So this would be one immediate way that all of you could be engaged or join if you're interested in the conversation, um, like basically immediately. This technical advisory council meets quarterly and those are public meetings. And this is really what this council does is help guide us at the state level to understand, okay, what is going on at the local implementation scale how are the policies that we're developing gonna support that? And then um, what are the emerging issues and how can we then guide our, our policy development to reflect those? And I just wanted to highlight here, Jacob Alvarez, who's from city of Coachella. Um, so Karina, I saw you noted there was a comment that you were from that area. He's, he just gave a great presentation to you know the whole group on extreme heat. And so we really listen, th these, we love our council and it's a really engaged council and there's always really rich discussion. Our next meeting isn't until June 11th, but there's work that we do in between and all of those meetings are open and we love having 
the public, you know, others there to join in the conversation. So this, please consider this a standing invitation to join any of these. And we'd love to introduce all of you to the council. Um, you'll see some other community-based organizations that are represented. We have um, Sona from Greenlining, um, Gloria Welton, and she's with a new organization that's, she used to be Scope LA, but she, um, it's just completely flying out of my head because she's with a, a new organization now, um, TNC. So we really are trying to get a broad picture and getting a diversity across the state and a diversity of issues and a diversity of opinions into our council. Hey, Juliet, I hate to interrupt. Uh, there's quite a few folks in the chat who are interested in actually being on the advisory council. Um, is there a difference be between attending the meeting, like the next meeting in June, and then uh, I think questions are on like, how do folks actually get onto the oh, gotcha. advisory council? Sorry. Yeah, I wasn't, I couldn't track all of it. I'm not, I can't, <laughs> not a digital native. Um, that is the, the council members are appointed by the director of OPR. And so that's a pretty small, even though there's 24 people on it, that's a, that's a, that's a defined body. So there's, they go, they get appointed every, people are on a two year cycle and then they get appointed um, by the director. So we can talk about that um, after. I don't know, yeah, I actually don't actually know the full process for how that works because I'm pretty new. So I'll, let, I'll find out more information on how the cycling of people onto the council works, but the meetings are completely open. We take comment and, and try to encourage conversation across the meeting um, with it. Sorry. Uh, shoot. Sorry. Hold on one second. <laughs> Uh, Fatima, OPR's director is Kate White, and um, <laughs> for more context, uh, Kate Gordon. Kate oh my Gordon. God, Kate Gordon. Uh, thank you. And Sorry. SGC sits under the Office of Planning and Research, and so we can actually facilitate some of those conversations if you all are interested. Sorry about that. Um, I had to get my dog was going bonkers, so I had to get another room. Okay. Um, in terms of resources that are, the other piece of what we do is develop the adaptation clearinghouse. And so there is, there are 900 resources on here. And so clearly it would be impossible to go through it all, but I just wanted to highlight one way that for, as you're doing your community engagement plan, please come to the adaptation clearinghouse because there's so much on here that can give you ideas of what other people are doing, um, where all the state level resources are, et cetera. And so let me just show you how you might wanna go in and, and, and um, look at this. You know, So as you see along the top here, we have the adaptation planning guide on here. I'll talk about that in a second. We have a whole section on case studies. So try, we, we've tried to curate a list of people doing different things in different regions to kind of give a sense of what, who's, what's this person doing on sea level rise and what's this organization doing on heat and et cetera. So they're, a bunch of case studies on there. What I'm showing right now is the resources topic, um, the resources page. So you can go in here and search by any number of different filters. I just gave a presentation in Marin County this morning, so I just had this pulled up. But um, you can look at different kinds of climate impacts, planning phases, etc., and um, type that in there. Some, you know, this will pop up. Here's an example of one of the reports, and then you can click on the source button, and it'll bring you to the actual report. So this, short of having kind of like people there to answer a phone, this is a first way to start peeking around to see what other places are doing, what people are trying to do to plan for climate change. Um, at any point, you can always reach out to us and ask us and we can help dig through this as well. The other thing that I mentioned is that the adaptation planning guide is on here. And I think you're going to get a deeper dive on that at one of the subsequent ones. But this is a resource that can also potentially be of value. Um, it helps kind of define a process by how you would start to think about developing your adaptation plans. So in this document, it's divided into four different phases and um, there's a hard copy or a web version of it, but what we've done is turn it into an online resource. And this was developed in partnership with Cal OES and then at OPR, we've put it up online. So just as an example, if you click into phase two, you know, there's all this information here. You can download the chapter. We walk you through sort of the way that you can move through the adaptation planning process for when you're assessing your vulnerability. So 
again, this goes super deep um, on the web. And so there's lots of information here to help guide you. The other place that you can turn to is CalAdapt. Um, this is a tool that helps connect all of the latest climate science that's been developed at the state level to the end user. And there's a new tool called the um, Snapshot tool that gives you some very high immediate information, high level immediate information around some of the key climate impacts, increasing temperature, precip, one wildfire. Sea level rise is forthcoming, so um, that will be something that you'll be able to search as well. This tool, it's still pretty complex, but it's made to be able to give you at least um, I will send the link. I, I did see that little chat pop up, but I'll send the links to everything that I'm talking about um, when we're done. But this gives you a first level glimpse of what the climate projections are like for your area of interest. And so it allows you to at least start somewhere. And then there's connections back to where the information lives. Um, thank you, Serena, for putting in the link. The other big thing that's going on right now is the update of the state adaptation strategy. So this is the document that really sets the policy at the state agency level about how we think we should be moving forward to respond to climate change and adapt to it. This gets updated every several of every three years. And so we're in the third year and we're, we are just starting the process now. And so this is another opportunity we would love to partner and engage on and understand how this can also serve at the you know, local implementation scale. The, the approach is basically um, to make sure that we're reflecting sort of this, the administration's goals, right, on climate strategy but we're using ICARP as sort of the way to connect to all the different state agencies. And we wanna develop this overarching strategy, but the, you know, the action is in the details, right? It's, um, there's a lot of stuff happening at the state level and there's for sure a lot of stuff happening at the local level. So what we're doing with this is sort of providing sort of directionality of where we should be going, but hopefully <laughs> if we do it right, allowing the flexibility of achieving those goals in the way that's most appropriate at the local scale. So the priorities that we're heading towards are these six that you see here at the top of it, strengthening protections for climate vulnerable communities, um, protecting public health and safety in the event and also during chronic climate impacts, reducing risks to the economy, helping actually some of this wording is going to change because we've gotten some feedback on it, but accelerating nature-based solutions and trying to move forward on um, ecosystem restoration and preservation. And then of course, using climate science and doing all of this in partnership. So these are really broad. And so hopefully you see yourselves and your work in here, but we will be doing some stakeholder workshops in mid-May through mid-June that we really want to get that feedback. So that's another immediate place, time and um, opportunity to really help shape this conversation as well. So um, that's the timeline. I'm going to stop there, but I'm happy to dig into more detail on any of this. I didn't want to go too long, although I think I may have already. Um, but just to say all of this is just the, the starting point. We, um, we really want to have this be an engaged process and so making sure that we're reflecting we're we're you know we're public servants so we are here to support <laughs> I don't know I don't know how else to say that so um, we really want to make sure that what we're doing is reflective of what the need is so I will stop there and happy to um, take any questions I think that's yeah I love that I love the conversation going on in the chat I think it was like big kind of I'm gonna use a different word than meaty. I feel like that's a weird word, but like kind of intensive topics um, that you might wanna dig into more. I really encourage you to get in touch with Julia to have those conversations. Similar to the investment plan, this is an opportunity to help direct the way the state is approaching climate adaptation for years to come. Um, and I think that this is a, you know, kind of a unique point we might not return to for a little while once the strategy gets set. So 
encourage you to um, keep in touch, set up time for conversations. Similarly, maybe um, like with the investment plan, if it seems like there's momentum to maybe set up another more specific meeting for this purpose, I think we could do that, or at least at the very least plug you into those workshops. So again, just keeping track of time, very sorry to have to move us along, but I wanna make sure that we have time in the last 15 minutes to get to Aegon's presentation. Um, continue to talk in the chat, ask additional questions, um, send emails directly to the folks who have offered it to, um, but for the sake of time, we move on. Thank you, Aegon, for being here today to talk about 375. Excited for your presentation. Great, thank you so much. And it's, no, it's really an honor to, to be with all of you. I'm, I'm sort of skimming your bios on the PACE website over here, and it's truly impressive. You're doing absolutely incredible work and hope we can just give a little bit of insight into some activities we're thinking about on a statewide level um, in relationship to some of the regions. You're all from very different parts of California. So thank you, yeah, Karen and Coral and uh, Sarah for, for having me here. Christina, good to see you. Um, as well. And uh, so what I, I wanted to talk just a tiny bit about the kind of regional planning framework and structure we have in California that um, many of you have probably been involved in policy for a long time. Some of you may, may or may not be newer. We do have a tendency to refer to bills like SB 375 as if everyone knows exactly what that is. And when you're deep in the weeds on it, you do and you refer to it, but the general public obviously doesn't think about those kinds of questions. And so I, I like to start by saying fundamentally all of us, we all live in communities, of course, but those communities are sort of nested in what we might call a region. And the regions are really different and vary. Um, and we have in California a system whereby we're trying to push those regions, those geographies to plan in a different way, to fundamentally plan for how they grow in a way that meets some regional goals, meets some state goals, and so th this bill that, that I'm, I'm gonna speak to a little bit now, Senate Bill 375, is a way of getting at that, um, but it, it has a little bit of origins. In, but, it, but ultimately each of your regions, and I see some of you are from San Diego or Sacramento, um, Central Coast, Southern California, anyway, a variety of places, each region has its own history and origin and sense of kind of what brings it together. I'm from the Bay Area and the Bay Area has a, has a long history of kind of thinking as a region to a certain extent, because there's this big body of water in the middle of it. And anything you do, you got to acknowledge that body of water to get from one side to the other. There's, you know, issues of, a, of a housing affordability. If you would need to get to a job in the, you know, in the peninsula and you're coming from the East Bay, there's kind of limited ways to get there. So by nature, the Bay Area has always had a little bit of kind of a long history of regional thinking. Um, the Central Valley as well, in terms of the kind of air quality and air pollution impact, we, we tend to see things that cross jurisdictional boundaries as being regional, right? Traffic, air pollution, but also housing costs and jobs and all, all of these sorts of issues become regional in nature. So what I wanted to just, yeah, spend a couple of minutes at a really high level. Let's see if you can see this. I was calling this regional planning 101, but it's not even really uh, full, fully a 101, it's just it's just kind of touching on a few points that I think are helpful in all of this. I mean, to state the obvious, California is this massive place, nearly 40 million people that's really best understood as a series of regions. And um, what the which the regions are and how you define them is a question. It's really better left to kind of each geography. Like, I don't know, that big whole green area to the north that you can see the northern part of the state, that's not one region, right? But it's but there is a set of attributes there. You know, the Bay Area might be a region, um, certainly San Diego, people think of as a region, but it really depends on what you're defining. And, you know, we often talk about how these geographies we live in are increasingly interconnected. Um, if you live in Southern California, you know that um, housing costs have pushed people further inland, deeper into Riverside and San Bernardino County. Of course, people in San Diego are, you know, are, are people coming into San Diego from Riverside County for jobs. Similarly, in the Bay Area, folks are coming from Stockton and um, in, in San Joaquin County or Modesto and Stanislaus County. Um, so long commutes is part of what makes us increasingly interconnected. But I think many of you know from your work on the ground, of course, profoundly um, unequal uh, the kind of experiences we have in, in various communities as a state. And this is the map of the Cal and virus green of the kind of various um, uh, sort of combined attributes of pollution and, 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 and poverty 
you know, factors and others, which you can see the San Joaquin Valley, and then of course, um, parts of Los Angeles, really a, a large share of that. So that's, that's important to kind of think about how these parts of the state are quite different. And when we're doing planning, you have to draw a boundary around a place to look at things. And so, um, you know, we, we did some work with using housing and transportation cost analysis to look at kind of where is that burden, right? If you're in the Bay Area, there's an affordability crisis. If you're in the Central Valley, there's also an affordability crisis. And they're somewhat different. And in part, because um, in the San Joaquin Valley, a much bigger share of people's income spent on transportation. Um, wages are lower, so housing costs are also a big burden. But that combination of housing and transportation costs fundamentally shows that, wait, where we live, how, we, you know, the income we earn, and then how we get around the system has a huge impact on our, our well-being and our ability to kind of move around the state. But also because California has this big climate goal, it's a huge impact from a climate perspective. So housing and transportation are core issues in solving climate change. And so SB 375 is sitting in that nexus. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it, but that's we, when we, this bill requires a certain kind of regional planning process, it comes out of our climate change laws um, as, as a state. And maybe I'll actually jump ahead. I'm realizing, I don't know if you guys can see it clearly enough here, um, this is this is the, the the kind of big law that was passed in 2006 um, for climate change, AB 32. So it's saying, how do we as a state across all aspects of our economy reduce greenhouse gas emissions? That being a kind of North Star. And it's there's various targets. There's a scoping plan that is done. There was one in 2017. There's one that's happening this year. Within that, within that scoping plan, there is... Um, there's a couple of things that we're focused on from a transportation emissions reduction. So like we're going from everything in society, you know, the gas stoves, getting those to electric, um, getting the factories to be cleaner, getting kind of, you know, decarbonizing our economy writ large is the big picture. And then within that, there's a chunk that's transportation. Well, it turns out transportation on its own is 40%. So transportation is like the single biggest, cause of climate change in California. And so this is the 41%, but when you expand out from just purely transportation emissions from people driving primarily um, cars that, that burn gasoline, actually the gasoline is produced in, right, um, you know, refineries. So that's under industrial. So it's actually probably more like half of all the emissions in California come from the transportation system. Now, when we translate that into, into, into kind of what we do about it, there's this sort of three things that we're trying to clean. One, get cleaner cars. Two, get cleaner fuels. Now that's where, as we shift all to 100% zero emission vehicles, it's ultimately all gonna be cleaner cars. But that, those two things on their own don't solve the equation. We actually have to change the land use patterns so people drive less. Now, this is where it starts to become difficult and complicated, and this is where SB 375 comes in, um, that we then have a structure whereby each of the metropolitan regions of California, so there's 18 of them, all these red geographies are the 18 metropolitan regions. So those of you who are in those blue areas on this map aren't in what's defined as a metropolitan planning organization geography. Um, there still is transportation funding, there still is land use development, all these issues still matter. It's just not subject to the regulatory structure of, of SB 375. Um, one of the things you'll see from this map is there's differently sized, right? Each of these in the San Joaquin Valley, every county, all eight counties are a separate region. The Bay Area is nine counties. Southern County, you know, Skag is half the state, it's 20 million people in those six counties. So very, very different places. Each one of these geographies, so the you know, black lines, those you know, what white letter um, acronyms for those for those councils of government is subject to meeting a per capita greenhouse gas reduction goal. So what they have to do is put together all of the transportation spending that they're going to do over a 30 year period, combine that with how much they're going to grow. So they're going to grow by a million people, half a million people, add those two things together in a model. So they model this out and say, all right, if everyone's going to live in these places and we're going to have a transportation network, which is here's, here's the bus network, here's the, the light rail network, here's the highway network. The combination of those things leads to, leads to what? 
are people going to be driving less? Are they going to be taking transit more? And we actually have to hit a target. These regions have to demonstrate that they're hitting a target where the average person is producing less greenhouse gas emissions. And the primary way they're getting less greenhouse gas emissions is by driving less, which is what we call vehicle miles traveled. So that's the, so you're going to hear a bunch of acronyms. People say GHG, people say VMT, all this stuff. Ultimately, that's what it's about, kind of planning a future where the average person doesn't have to, um, doesn't have to drive as much because they have alternatives. Maybe they live in a community where they can walk to the grocery store instead of driving, or their school is nearby, or their job is on transit and they can take transit for some of those trips. Um, or we don't continue to build housing an hour and a half away from the existing community for affordability. And so we, we were as a, as a region, a little bit more kind of, you know, close together. So that's the sort of kind of big idea that gets put together in what are called regional plans. I want to make just a couple of quick points. There's a lot more we can say about this. And so Kieran hey. and Coral, yeah, please. Oh, Aegon, I was just going to, I'm tracking the chat and oh, yeah. I I'd love to just direct you to a couple of themes of questions. Please. One around how about how SB 375 is both a framework for you know land use and transportation at the individual level, but also how it's addressing industry, uh, you know, um, goods movement, things like that as a you know broader societal piece. And then also getting into land use, I think some folks were bringing up the fact that in addition to you know the transportation housing connection. Um, well within our GHG scope is the need to address, you know, connections around food access um, and, and things like that. I know that's very broad buckets, but yeah, no, no, that's helpful. Me, let me just maybe sort of make a make a, a sort of broad point about that, which is that ultimately I'm focused on this GHG piece because that's the, that's the big lever the state has. A region is totally up to itself what it defines as the core goals of its regional plan. And so, for example, um, in San Diego or in the Bay Area or in any county, you can say, we actually fundamentally care about equity. We want to make sure that the, the transportation um, burden facing low-income households goes down over time. That's not a state goal, right? It's, that's not, you know, you're not evaluated based on that, but a region can decide or food access, right? We want to make sure as we plan, we're protecting our farmland. Um, and then we're, through that, we're delivering some of the, you know, an economic development vision for, for the agricultural land. A, an entire, a region absolutely can put that in. And so in some ways, regional planning is, a, is kind of a framework for all the jurisdictions and elected officials and community groups and, and folks to work together towards a common vision for your region. The state requires regions to do this with this GH, with this greenhouse gas target and with a housing target. So I, I don't wanna make this too, you know, we, we get into it, but this is a diagram and I'm happy to share these slides and, and, there, and there's, there's a link. Um, I had some students build this out, but there's sort of two things we're trying to get regions to do, build enough housing and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. All of those other topics are totally, absolutely fundamentally important and are included. Um, goods movement, freight, and those issues, those are already spoken to to an extent in the transportation plan. They're not spoken to very well, obviously, because we see massive impacts from trucks in existing communities and the huge pressure to convert actually residential land to warehouses. I know those of you that are out in the Inland, em Inland Empire are seeing that. So those are issues that are regional in nature, but the primary way we, we solve them, frankly, is local government zoning decisions. And our the kind of punchline to this whole point here, and this is just a map of the Bay Area, we can't meet these goals as, as, as a region or a state without the cooperation of all the local governments. So each local government kind of has its own ability to make decisions within its geography about zoning. Um, and the state's trying to push them on housing um, but, but the levers that we have are, are, are far more limited and we can though push a little bit on, on sort of where the transportation network goes. Cause that's, that, that is, that tends to be much larger than the individual jurisdiction. So Karen, I know I didn't, I didn't address a, 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 a lot of those things. Um, I'm happy to address it anymore. I wanted to make one sort of just final point that often comes up in these dialogues, which is why do we need to reduce, um, why, why should we care about reducing driving if everyone drives an electric vehicle? 
right? This comes up a lot in these things. Like if the governor signed this thing, everyone's gonna have to buy electric vehicles only after 2035. Well, it, it turns out, and this, this chart up here is basically showing we're actually not on track to meet these targets, right? We're not, we're not moving in the right direction fast enough. Um, it turns out that if even if every new car is an electric vehicle in 2035, there's going to be a bunch of non-electric vehicles on the road for decades. So those are going to cause pollution. And so we actually care about those. But ultimately, how much we drive is what is part of you know fueling the growth and pushing our regions outward into the farmland um, that's having these other impacts. And so we talk about co-benefits of a more kind of compact development. So VMT is a metric of measuring how we're how we're how how the driving continues to contribute to an expansion of our metropolitan regions, um, and so just to make that as a as a yeah a, a quick point because we hear pushback. I know we're short on time, so um, quick dive through. Uh, not even quite forty years of regional planning, but um, I'll I'll take a look at some of these questions. Also happy to um, send some responses back, Coral, through you and Karen. Awesome. So we are capturing all the notes, just so everybody knows we're going to download the chat so we can organize and make sure that there's follow up and we can put folks back in touch on those specific questions. A reminder that it looks like next steps for us are to set up some time with Anna, at the very least, at CARB to talk about the investment plan and also Juliet to talk about the adaptation strategy and maybe some more about ICARB. Um, and I think <laughs> This was so exciting just reading what folks were saying in the chat about like does regional planning really affect local neighborhoods and equity and i think this is just the start of the conversation i know you all have a lot of experience with this kind of work so wanted to remind you we're going to have a climate planning 101 session down the line and i think this information is really important to keep in mind like okay there's regional planning being done uh, do local governments have to follow the regional plans? Like what is that interplay and how does that affect you and your communities and your work on the ground? So um, I think I'll stop there. I know we have like 30 seconds left. I wanted to see if folks would feel comfortable, whoever wants to um, turn on their camera so we can take a picture for Earth Day like Irene suggested at the end, we can all smile. And then Julia, do you think we should um, just take a screenshot or use the recording? Probably a screenshot. Um, I'm happy to take a quick screenshot, although my connection a little poor. Someone else might need to do it. I'm not seeing everyone's video pop in. Okay, I can do it. Um, so everybody just, <laughs> yeah, get camera ready and smile. I don't know how long this is going to take, so just keep smiling. Okay, I'm going to say three, two, one. Okay, I think we got it. Good enough. <laughs> if anybody else took